Yeah. Okay, good evening everyone. Sorry about the, the slight technical hitch up at the start. Yeah, I couldn't log in with two separate devices, so I've had to log out my laptop and come in with my iPad. Um, so I am Gary Lowe, if you don't know me already. Uh, sometimes known as a tartan turner because I wear a kilt all the time. Uh, I live in the north of Scotland. Very cold up here, but not this week. It's roasting. Um, a bit about myself first. Um, born in Glasgow. I started working in the shipyards for a while. Then I went into military. Did in the military service for 22 years. Uh, left the military and then I just went into engineering. So renewables, oil and gas, pretty much in and out of that for well, since 2006, since I left the military, up until sort of nowadays. Um, turning wise, uh, I first sort of got into turning or really knew about turning probably back in about 2001 ish. Um, never really knew about it before. Sat at work having a coffee and the, the rare chance that we get a coffee break, and the boss had thrown in some old magazines of wood turning. So picked one of them up, had a quick read, and thought, oh, I don't mind fancy giving that a try. So pretty much did. Went out and bought my first lathe not long after, which was one of the old Perform um, variable speed lathes. So that's the, the cheap yellow Axminster version. Um, I don't know if they still do perform anymore, I'm not sure. Um, I sort of hacked and bashed about for a couple of years. Uh, because I was still in the military at the time, I never really had any time to go and get any tuition or lessons, uh, especially where I was living as well at the time, which was up here. Um, there's not very many sort of turners up here that do lessons, certainly not then. There still isn't now. Um, so I got kind of disillusioned after a couple of years. And basically I gave up for about three or four years, which is probably one of my biggest regrets. Um, because when I gave up that time, silly old me went and sold absolutely everything that I owned. My lathe, all my tools, all my timber, everything. Um, work was busy at the time, so I never really had much time to turn anyway. Um, when it quietened down and I was getting closer to getting out of the military, I thought, hey, I fancy doing wood turning again. So, of course, in the years that I'd given up, the prices had all gone up like that, just like everything else does. So I had to go and buy everything again. So I bought a new lathe, I bought new tools and started all over again. Um, so it was a slow process to start with. Um, again, because I lived up north at a similar time, which I, I still do now, um, there was no one to have lessons. Um, I was still kind of busy with work as well. So I didn't have the time to go further south to, to go for a proper lesson. So up until this day now, I have not had a lesson off anybody, which again is a big regret for me because I'd probably been a lot more advanced by now if I had gone and get some proper tuition. So in theory, that's the best thing you can do as soon as you start turning. If you're a new guy, seek out somebody who knows what they're on about, somebody who can show you how to turn properly uh, from the very start. It's a slow process, but it's very, very enjoyable. Um, Inspiration-wise for turning, like everyone else has said on here, there's so many people around the world that can inspire you. And that's all walks of turning, from just plain, simple, round and brown, to the more fancy, decorated, coloured, off-centre, you name it. There's somebody out there that will be able to teach you or to show you along the way to getting better at it. Um, so if I can say one thing, go and get a lesson from somebody. It might seem expensive at the time, but the wealth of knowledge they can pass on to you is just 
you can't beat it. There's, there's no point just hacking and bashing like I did when I first started, which is probably why I gave up in the first place. Because uh, I got disillusioned with it, I was getting bored with it, because I seemed to be doing the same thing all the time. Um, the thing that actually got me back into it when I decided to start it up again um, was people like Mick Hanbury and Phil Irons with the Cullen. Um, that was a new avenue for me at the time. I'm trying not to move my hands. Uh, so I decided to, to go try Cullen and sort of different textures and things like that. And basically, I've not stopped since. So, yeah, it's always, always, always good to try a different avenue. What do I like to turn? Well, again, like a lot of people, I'll turn absolutely anything and everything from a small bowl and a thimble to a pen to goblets to hollow forms, colored card, you name it. Um, I'm not one of these people that likes runs of things, production turning. I mean, those guys are absolutely brilliant. You can sit there and make 10, 20, 100 the same thing. I'll take my hat off to you guys. That is just unbelievable dedication. I get bored after about three. So I always like to do something different. Um, where do I get my timber? And do I convert my timber? Well, most of my timber I get from up round about where I live in the north of Scotland. I'm quite happy that one of my mates and a neighbour my neighbour, I say, he's probably my closest neighbour, about 200 yards away. Um, he owns a sawmill and he's a tree surgeon, so he gets loads of wood. So I get to pick and choose from there. Um, you get the usual people get to hear about you. They'll drop wood off, they'll phone you up, ask you whether you want some. Uh, and always it's yes, no matter what it is. If it's no good for turning, it'll go on the fire. So it'll keep me warm in winter because it does get cold up here in winter. Um, mostly I use dry timber. I do convert some of my own. Um, I've got a huge pile of elm outside at the moment. The elm up here is really, really nice. And thankfully at the minute, we still have an awful lot of elm up here. Um, the Dutch elm hasn't quite took effect up here, although it has. I mean, there are little parts of it and it is starting to get worse, but nowhere near like it is down in England. I mean, we have tons and tons of elm up here, which is really good. Um, a lot of it's bird as well. Um, I don't turn full time, unfortunately. Um, I still have a full time job. I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, I would like to turn full time. Um, the only problem I have geographically where I live I'm up in the back of beyond, there's nobody near. There's not many people up here that turn other than the, the clubs. Um, so, I mean, most of the students I've had up here have come from down south. Uh, I've had a few around locally. Um, but again, I don't know, I don't know whether it's a population, what, there just doesn't seem to be as much of a draw up here as it does down south. And I say that because I used to live down in Newbury and Berkshire for 15 years when I was in the military, so I know there's an awful lot more going about there. I did actually join a club down there for a while as well. Um, but then I get posted away again, so. Um, most of my work I sell, we have a large country estate up here and they have a, an art gallery in there. So I tend to sell an awful lot of it in there. Um, I also sell in a, I would say, an art and craft shop, a higher end art and craft shop in Elgin Town Centre itself. Um, but the funny thing is, the gallery on the, the country estate charges about two or three times the price of the local shop, but I seem to sell more in the, the more expensive place than I do in the, the less expensive place. Um, Again, I don't know why that is. Maybe people think they're getting more for their money if it comes from a proper gallery. Um, to me, my pieces are the same no matter where they go. Um, it's just a case of how much profit the art gallery puts on top of it. Uh, and it's quite steep in that place. 
Uh, the shop's not too bad, but they have to make a living as well, I'm afraid. So I get what I want, they get what they want, and we're all happy. Um, where would I see my turning going in the future? I'd probably like to do it more full time. Um, I'd like to retire from my normal work. Um, I think it's just the enjoyment thing as well, really, to turn full time for me. I don't get bored. I mean, I would be in here at eight in the morning till eight at night, uh, but the wife tends to nag me. Um, but no, I'd like to, I'd like to turn more, certainly do it more as a living. Um, I'd also like to do a bit more sort of, I don't know, maybe try some pyro as well. I've done a few bits of pyro, bits of piercing, but I'd like to advance that and incorporate it into my work a bit more. Um, a bit more off-centre as well. Some of the off-centre I do is, I would say, fairly basic compared to some people. Um, but again, it's something I do like. <coughs> Excuse me. Ma. So the last thing I would say, again, is I've got a wee cheat sheet down here, as you probably noticed. It's uh, my biggest regrets. Well, obviously, that was giving up turning for a few years because it cost me a lot more to start up again and not getting professional lessons. Um, like I said earlier, if I had lessons before, I could probably see myself a lot further on than I am. Um, but that's pretty much about me at the moment. Uh, so I'll start showing you about my workshop. If there's any questions while I'm changing the view on the camera, just give us a shout, Paul. Yeah, just one. What do you enjoy most about demonstrating? Sorry, say that again? What do you enjoy most about demonstrating? Um, I like doing off-centre work, but again, it all depends on the lathe that you're turning on at the club. Um, some clubs, as you know, only have small midi lathes. Some are big, heavy ones. Um, so off-centre and colour work, obviously. So I think I'm quite well known for a bit of colour work. So yeah, colour and off-centre work, really. Okay, so I've got, my, I've got my iPad and a little homemade tripod thing, so to try and stop you getting seasick. So I'll move nice and slow. So I'll just change the view on the iPad. Okay, so we'll just start from one end and work all the way around. Sorry about the LED light flickering. So we'll come in the door. In fact, I can put that down and swivel it. So we've got a small microwave. There's a tiny dehumidifier there, which I was going to make my own kiln, but I changed my mind and I've got an old fridge now, which you'll see in a minute. So I'm going to turn that into a kiln. I'm trying to turn this as slow as possible so it doesn't get all shaky. So just tell me, I'm just moving the gimbal. Just tell me if it gets too shaky and you start feeling queasy. So in this corner, I've just got a little, little, little workbench. I tip it forward slightly. Under the bench, I've got some rough turns there. Some go back as far as 2015. The majority are about 2018. Um, I have turned a lot of uh, roughed out ones lately, so I've not got all that many left. Um, so, little bench planer and thickness are there. Little cheap and cheerful ones. I don't use them very much, so I don't really need to spend a lot of money on them. Okay, so there's my laptop sat on top of it. Going around here, just a little Dexian shelving unit. Uh, with most of my colours, stains. Now, the only timber I keep in my workshop now is exotics, which you can see down there. Uh, I did have a lot of timber in here before, but I moved it out to another shed just to give me that little bit more room. So just turning round. So there, and I'll just zoom if I can. 
No, maybe not. Come on, camera. Stop playing up. So, first lathe of oh, MIDI Pro. Um, so it's a baby Stratos, really. Uh, brilliant piece of equipment. It's a three phase down to one phase, so there's no drop in power whatsoever. Um, I'll just move this tripod to get a, a closer view. Try and move it as slow as possible. I think the company that name it's called Dreschel Bedarf Schultz. So if there's any Germans in the audience, just tell me if I pronounced that right. Uh, underneath it is a small um, cam vac. Small window up there with some different color samples. So that's pretty much the stains. I've got water-based and spirit-based. So we've got chestnut and Hampshire Sheen Intrinsics there. Just darken round nice and slowly. How's the picture quality at the moment, Paul? It's not good. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Okay. So again, just a little bench storage unit there. Um, the boxes on the top shelf. I've got a woodcut bowl saver, which I got for 50 quid. Uh, we've got a fluting jig, the old pyro, and a few other bits under there. The blanks in the bottom are from the old fella that sold me the, the bowl hollower. I think the reason I got it so cheap was he says, oh, can you code these out for me? So there's about a dozen blanks down there of all various sorts and sizes. So again, I'm going to move it. So sorry if it gets a bit seasicky. So on the top, I got a couple of chucks there. I've got uh, two Novas and a Vicmark. The little shelving unit has just got some colours in there and some coloured waxes. Um, because I do teach, obviously I've got to have the, the first aid kit, eye wash bottles and whatnot. And then next to them there's various brushes, sponges, etc. Pan round again. So, main lathe coming up, which is uh, Record Maxi 1. I've had that for about eight years now, I think. Bought it from Harrogate Show, which, as we mentioned earlier, is cancelled this year, unfortunately. So, sitting above it, you can see there I've got a Fordham. I've also got a, a Dremel hanging up there, and I've got a few other ones around about the workshop. Mainly just for little bits of carving and whatnot. As I say, I don't do much piercing. Um, I don't think I've got the patience to, to pierce as much, say, as Helen does or Pat. Um, so it's mainly for carving and texture. So again, we'll up sticks and move along. Now this workshop I'm in, <coughs> excuse me, was built at the same time as my house. I live in a 170 year old croft. So this building was an old barn at one time, uh, just for a couple of cattle and whatnot. So there's not a straight line inside it. Every beam and post in it is all different thicknesses. Um, so lining it out is a nightmare. Um, on the lathe itself at the moment, it's just a leather strop for sharpening up my carving gouges. Um, Above the lathe are those little sanding wheels there. They're just uh, the fibre or nylon wheels with grit, grit impregnated. Just different makes and types. Uh, we'll pan round again, nice and slowly, hopefully. So in the corner, I've got face shields of various types. I've got my, my Trend Air Shield. I've got a cheap and cheerful, and I've got the bionic one there. Um, my sharpening station, or one of them, it's probably the only one I use at the moment, is the Pro Edge. I do have a, an eight inch bench grinder, which I still use occasionally. Um, I do find the Pro Edge very easy to use, <coughs> very quick. Now, 
the health and safety guys amongst you, or the ones with the keen eyes, will have noticed I have to put the side guard off. I only do that when it's just me in the workshop. When students in here, it goes back on. The reason I take it off is I can change belts within seconds of it off, rather than within a minute or so. Um, the cabinet came from a hospital. A good mate, John, used to be a, a maintenance guy in the hospital, and they were chucking about 20 of these out. So I said, I'll have one when I saw he had one. Uh, they're on wheels, so they can wheel about anywhere. On the left-hand side, as you're looking at it, there's a cupboard at the bottom where I keep my air compressor for my airbrushes. On the right-hand side, <clears throat> on the bottom, I've got all the grits of Abernet that I use, a couple of spare belts for the, the pro grind, and I've also got more belts in the top. Yeah. Top drawer is all attached to show you. Right? Most of you know what they're like. Uh, and the white box is for my vacuum chuck. So again, we'll just pan round nice and slow. And I'll walk back just so you get a better picture because I can't seem to find the zoom in this iPad for some reason. Okay, so a little tool cabinet there. Um, I keep most of my flammable liquids and whatnots in there. So most of my aerosols, my lacquers, my oils and my waxes are all kept inside. Um, I also have chuck jaws in there. I have more sandpaper. I have lots of buffing mops in there. Um, kit parts, so pen blanks, things like that. Internals for pens, which I don't make anymore really. Uh, I've got some tools in the back there, just on a, a homemade tool rack. So again, I'll just try and move it slowly so I don't make you seasick. So various, various tools and makes. Uh, I've no particular preference to what tool I use. As long as it's sharp, that's fine by me. Uh, if it's not sharp, then it's not going to cut. So above that, I've got the little micro clean which they say is uh, big enough to do a single garage. I would doubt that, but it seems to do okay. Um, the window at the back of it, you used to see out into the field at the back, um, but that's where I house my large extractor now. Um, just basically to keep the noise down from the workshop, because it was quite loud. So I've just built a small shed on the back of the workshop and just put the extractor in there. It's a one and a half horsepower extractor. <clears throat> Excuse me, which is hard piped, as you see just down there. Just four inch sewer pipe. Comes down at the end of the back. A little whiteboard at the top there, just for explaining things to students or for myself if I'm trying to work something out. Uh, as we pan round again, calipers of various odds and sods. So we got Simon Hope, we got Sorbet, we got you name it. Got a little gas fire heater there in the corner. But it does get cold in the winter, although this is fully insulated, so it keeps the heat quite well. <coughs> and it stays fairly cool in the summer as well. Um, I've got the RS2000 hollowing tool down there. I think it used to be known as the Stuart system. Um, and if I do want to do something big, I've got a nice big three quarter inch bowl gouge down there. Big heavy thing. So we'll pan round again. So a small red toolbox in the corner just holds spanners and screwdrivers, just general, general tools. Uh, third lathe is just a little DML 320. Uh, I mainly use that to put my buffing system on at the moment. 
Uh, so if I've, I need a nice polish, I'll just put the buff in there and polish it up. The tools on the floor, uh, they were given to me by an old fella down in Newbury that lived across the road from me. They're all carbon steel, but they still work. Uh, I think they're old Ashley Isles tools as well, so really good tools, but I don't use them all the time. So panning round again. Just have another tool board there. So go back there. So there's my woodcut hollowing tools, which I do most of my hollowing with. So I've got a straight one and uh, the full swan neck. Um, a couple of big angles, tips, texture, whatnot tools there. I tilt this forward. So again, I'm just going to tilt the gimbal. So sorry about the, the shaky bit. So the little green and red plastic thing just contains different acrylic paints. So colors, metallic colors, translucent colors. A sink, which is plumbed in. Now, I forgot to mention at the start of this, I'm actually moving out of this workshop at the moment. So it's a bit untidy. Um, about three hours ago, you couldn't walk in here. It was that messy. So they've gone back into the new workshop, which is just across the way there. Uh, my daughter's going to have this one for a bit more privacy. Um, so I've got a... A little cheap Dremel-like tool there, which I've just made a small sled, um, so I can do fluting with that. And again, I've made a, a homemade, if I just stick the tripod there, go to the back. Again, a very, very basic rest. So that'll go in the, the tool post for the banjo and the small Dremel type tool there will just slide backwards and forwards on that to whatever pattern I want. I do have the the Paul Howard type one, um, which was in one of them cabinets. So another little cabinet on top of it is a Simon Hope sanding discs. Yes, I do have two sets there. One is the <laughs> the hex end and one is the round end. Um, I originally bought one from Simon a while ago and uh, like a lot of people, we buy stuff off tunnels that are given up. So the other set was bought nice and cheap. In the drawers inside there, um, I'll tell you what, I'll lift this out so you can get a closer view. So I'll try and move slow so I don't shake it. Oh, you probably hear my old knees creaking as I bend down as well. So, for all the follically challenged people, you won't need any of these. A couple of hair dryers in there. If I get impatient waiting on things to dry, mainly on demonstrations, um, I try to let things dry naturally if I'm in my own workshop. Uh, you get a much better finish if they dry naturally. Next drawer down. El Cheapo grinder with a, a mini Arbitic attachment on it. Um, they used to sell these attachments, but I've not seen the actual attachment for a while. I've just seen the actual Arbitic. <coughs> Excuse me. And in the bottom, grinder, various glue guns, etc. So, creaky knees again as a stand up. Not too shaky if I'm holding this, is it, Paul? Okay, so I've got an old band saw there that I've had, again, does for what I need. If that doesn't do, I've got a couple of chainsaws which will do it. Or if it's a huge piece, I'll go down to my mate Sawmill and he's got half a dozen huge big industrial ones. 
So working along here, I've just got a big double cupboard, all homemade out of scraps. Um, I've got a few bits and bobs which I'll show you a bit closer later on. So we've got part finished stuff, we've got stuff that's sort of done halfway through, you name it. I'm um, going all the way down to the, the bottom of the workshop. I've got a small pillar drill, which I don't use a great deal either. Um, occasionally I will do. In this corner I've got the small fridge that I mentioned earlier that I'm going to turn into a small kiln. Mainly for just drying off small boxes and things like that. The top of it is a microwave. That's one of these microwave oven grill things which was too big for the house now, so I've got it out here. <coughs> on top of that, that's just been flung on there because, as I said, I'm moving workshops. On the bottom there, big piece of monkey puzzle, which is probably about 18 inches high by about, I don't know, 12, 14 inches. Uh, so I'm looking forward to taking all the bark off that and getting covered with all the sap and gunge. Uh, in the corner again, just some more Dexian shelving with some more colours, some SWD-40 wood glues and right in the corner is where I've just chucked loads of things at the moment. So, um, so I've got pack certificates there, pack testing certificates for all my gear for when I do demonstrations and whatnot. I know it's not a legal requirement, but a lot of places like you to have it. Uh, on the back door, we've got various turning smocks. Now, the only other wood that I have sort of in this building, oh, there's one of my cats. This building has um, got a porch on it. So, if we pan round to the right, I've got a few nice little burrs that I struggle to lift some of them. In the corner, I've got some log form branch wood. And if I pan around to the other side, sorry, moving a bit quick there. So we get firewood and then we get a lot more logs. Predominantly yew and laburnum. <coughs> There's a few big cherry ones there as well. So I'll just walk back in. Shut the door to try and keep the light out. Right, so I'll place my iPad down here. I'll straighten it up and I can show you some work now if you want. So if I reverse the camera so I can see myself, so I can uh, see what I'm actually showing you. So I've just got a few pieces out. So, hollow form, carved and coloured, made out of elm. So all the colours are just blended from the bottom up to the top. That's about eight, nine inches by about seven or eight inches, something like that. I've not got a great deal here because thankfully just before lockdown I just took a lot of stock to the gallery so <coughs> it's not a great deal. I was just playing about with something here. Again this is an elm. So that's just carved and it's not pierced but it's just textured with a Dremel or the Fordham. Got a piece of cherry that was given to me by the neighbours, soaking wet. So it's just had a bit of hydro dipping on it. Hydro dipping, marbling, whatever you want to call it. Again, just another small 
one of these. This is uh, the metallic green paint. <coughs> I like doing hollow forms in boxes. So we've got a little box here. Just got some copper wire with some leather on it. Um, all you do is just pull the tabs to the side, pops off, and that's just a nice piece of mottled beach. And then I've just got a bit of, I um, can't remember what the, the little inlay was in there. I think it might have been Babinga actually. The copper wire was just bent round an old nail. So at the time I was doing the marbling on that big piece, I've got a, a small box with a nice wee pop lid. Here's my little piggy, as my mate calls it. So again, that is just a small box. The top end is a sort of inspired by Terry Scott. Um, as you can see, two up and two down, not eight up and eight down like Dave's. All right, Dave. And again, that is just blended color from the bottom all the way up to the little piggy nose. Off cut from a, a chippy shop. Carpenter shop, sorry if you if you're not used to what a chippy is. So a little play with some piercing. Extremely soft timber this. I think it's just a redwood or something like that. Horrible stuff to turn but it actually turned out not too bad. <coughs> so we got a little off centre Saturn bowl. So I don't know if you can see when it sits on the shelf. It just rock down. So a little point just helps it rock. We have a nice bit of a uh, rippled sycamore with some aluminium on the top. Turned on the lathe with normal high speed turning tools. Just a couple other things. So, what a lot of people know me for is the old cosmic clouds. That's just a small one I've got here. They are Joe Sonia paints. Um, I'll show you a couple of other things. I had a nice bit of chestnut, but it had a huge crack in, or a couple of cracks in it. So I've just dyed it, and I've just put some copper wire, drilled and put copper wire to stitch them. It was too nice to throw in the fire. And then it's just got a small lid on top. Uh, something else I used to do my demos was a little off box with an off-center lid. Looks a bit like a duck. Wasn't intended to be a duck, but at one of the demos somebody said it looked like a duck. So again, a nice little pop lid. And it's got some nice grain on it that you can line it up with really well. Again, some more boxes. Just coloured and carved. And again, that's just some of the, the mortal beach. I've got quite a lot of this. I was given this by a young apprentice that works at our work. Somebody cut it up on his farm about 15 years ago and just left it there, so I managed to have that.
Um, just a couple more things I'll show you and then we can go into questions. So I do do plain, I don't colour everything. Um, so this is just a bit of rippled and burred chestnut. Uh, you can't quite see it shimmering in this light in here, but it's a lovely piece of timber. Um, again, a very small, small piece of lime, which was cored out. So this is the smallest core. So I'll just show you a couple more things and then that'll be me finished showing you them. So if you excuse me, you just bear with me a minute. I've just got to set a couple on the stand. I would say talk amongst yourselves, but you're all muted, so you couldn't do that. <clears throat> So again, fairly plain timber. This is a piece of bar black poplar. Um, on the bottom as well, lovely timber. So again, too nice to put any color on. Although I have colored these before, so it's not a problem. Um, there we go. I'm just trying to get the ripple so you can see. That's about 17 or 18 inches, if I remember rightly. So, and the last thing I'm going to show you is if I can tilt this. In fact, I'll reverse the camera so you can see it better. Right, so I'll just, oh, don't know what happened there. So there we go. So that's just a little trio. Started off, I've done the one on the left hand side. And the boss came in with a cup of coffee and says, oh, it needs a friend. So I did the one on the right hand side. And thankfully she came in later again with another cup of coffee. You know what, it needs something in the middle now. So, so we got three pieces there. So that's just uh, coloured waxes in the middle. So the blue and the red are coloured waxes. And then right in the centre is the spirit stains. So it's like the sun and the moon, obviously. And then so the small one in the middle and in the centre there, just like little clouds. And that was just off a board of sycamore that was lying about. So they're about 14 by oh, six or seven. All right, so I'll just lock this camera back up. Sorry for the wobbling about again. And turn the camera around so you can see my ugly mug. <clears throat> right, so that's pretty much it in a nutshell, as I say, there would have been more in here and it would have been tidier, but between jumping from this workshop and the new one, which is just outside, you just couldn't move. So I've been lumbering stuff in and out and out and in. And so, so here we go. Um, questions, anybody? Yeah, got a few for you. Uh, what's under the blue, okay. blue towel wall? Ah, <laughs> Right, I shall just, I mean here, if that's what you're on about, it's rolling pins from Asda. Solid dry beach, £1.50. <laughs> so I use that for making small finials and the like. Um, if I just pan across here, so it's excellent for doing finials and I say £1.50 if it goes wrong it goes wrong um, 
So don't all go rushing out to Asda, especially if you live up near Elgin. Because uh, I normally go in and buy about a dozen or so at a time. And they look at me kind of strangely. Okay, any more? Yeah, uh, have you got ballast blocks on the lathe? I have, and I'll tell you for why. As I said, this building is 170 year old. The place I live is called Moss of Bermuckety, which means moss or boggy. So the ground around here is very boggy. When we moved in here, this whole workshop had uh, decking boards as a floor. Um, so at the time, all I did was put a small concrete pad under the lace, um, but because the ground is so soft, it still sometimes gets a wee movement. Five blocks and two hard blocks, five steps away from here. I put a whole concrete slab down the whole thing. Um, so if I pan around here, sorry if I'm going too fast, you look under the little DML, that's got a concrete slab as well. Uh, and if I pan around again, there used to be two of those there, but they actually go about four foot wide and about three foot deep. And that's where I originally had the, the maxi one. Um, I have turned some large pieces off center. So again, you need a nice solid floor for that. Um, so hence why I have put a big concrete slab in my new workshop. Okay. Great. Any more? Yeah. What grade, what grit grade do you favour on the Pro Edge belts? I normally use a 120 ceramic. Uh, I do have finer, I do have the was it the 1200 and the 600? I don't have the diamond one. So I think the diamond one's about 40 pounds. I don't see the point of that for high speed turning tools. Although I've got a smoother one on there at the moment. But I'll, I'll either one usually for turning tools and it'll be the ceramic. Yep, I don't know if you can see on that well worn one. That's the 120. Obviously the blue one I'll use for reprofiling I need any reprofiles. And the good thing about it is retruing the edge up, you're not actually like regrinding all the time. So it is just a very quick touch touch and that's you done. Okay. Thanks. Um, will you change much with your new workshop for, in terms of layout? Um, it will be slightly different because this particular one, the internals are um, seven meters by three meters, and I can touch the ceiling if I, because I've put a false ceiling in, because I've got two, two storage pods at the top. Um, I'll just show you up there. Um, so the new one is six meters by four meters, but it's got a much higher ceiling as well. So it will be slightly different, yes. My, my maxi one will be out on its own. And hopefully, fingers crossed, if the world of internet lets me, I might even start doing some IRDs or possibly even some more YouTube or whatever. Because at the moment, my laptop has to be on an Ethernet cable. Because uh, we don't get very good signal around here, although it has got better since I got um, line of sight internet. Nope. Any more while well, I let my cat in? Yeah. What type of turn in sell best at the gallery and the craft shop? Um, 
It varies, really. The mo I think that the most things I've sold at the gallery are big, large, coloured platters of bowls and a few coloured hollow forms as well. Um, in the shop, it's pretty much anything, really. Uh, I don't think there's the same sort of item sells all the time. I, I mean, I do put a lot of coloured stuff in there, so uh, I'd probably say coloured bowls in there or coloured rimmed bowls. Okay. Can you talk a little about the colouring process on the blue sycamore urn? <laughs> On which one, sorry, on? The Blue Sycamore Urn. Ah, that one. That one there. I think that one, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so... I know what you're on about, so I'll put it back. So I originally, once I got the surface preparation done properly, um, completely stained it in black black spirit stains, uh, rubbed it back until I was happy. I can, if you want, you can apply more black and rub it back again, uh, just to get different highlights all around it. And then that one, it was just applied um, light blue of the chestnut stains. And again, rub back, add, rub back until you get the desired effect that you're after. Um, it was then, sorry, I'm just turning this to get the glare away from the light. It was then sealed with lacquer. So normally I'll put maybe a couple of coats of satin lacquer on to start with, de in between once they dry, and then one to two coats of gloss lacquer on, and then just polish it up as I'm going along. Uh, the high shine I get on mine I use with um, micromesh and water. You can use things like the extra fine Hampshire Sheen, or not Hampshire Sheen, sorry. Sorry, Glenn, if you're there. Um, Yorkshire Grit. It pretty much does the same thing. You can do it with um, cutting compound, buffing compound, anything like that. They all kind of work fairly similar. Um, just, I'm lucky that when I left, her Majesty's service. Um, I got lots of micromesh because the station I was at, was, or one of the stations I was at, was shutting down and they were just throwing all this in the bin. And I mean, a roll of micromesh is like 150 to 200 pounds and they were just chipping it. So at the time, I just went, I love some of that rather than going in a skip. So I use micromesh because I've got a lot of micromesh. But I can use, as I say, any sort of buffing compound, so even tea cut to an extent, but that tends to be a wee bit rough. Hey, thanks. With your small boxes, do you power carve or hand carve? Uh, the ones like this, I, t I presume you're on about this. This was done with the Fordham. So yeah, power carve. Um, little Miss Piggy. <laughs> this was done with um, a Proxon angle grinder, just with a small rotary curved head. And just done that way, sorry. So pretty much, if I can power do it, I will do it. Because I've, I've not got a lot of carving chisels. I've just got the little um, flexi cut ones that you can interchange the hands on and I get a bit impatient sometimes. Yeah. Who inspired your, the, the, the one you got the three boards, um, the, the, like the sun and the moon one, who, what was the inspiration behind that one? Um, I don't know if I had inspiration. It was just one of these things I was playing one day as I said, I only done one to start with. I just had these boards of sycamore lying about. Um, and I thought I'd just put it off. I've done a few of these before, but not as a as a trio. 
So it's only got one off centre, but as you can see there, you've got what, a good 10 inch off that way and only two to three inches off that way. So um, I don't know. It, you could probably be inspired by quite a lot of people and not even know about it. So obviously, I suppose the inside part with the spirit stains there is a bit sort of um, Viking bullish, so maybe Nick Agar for that. Um, the outside here has just been done with a Arbitec. Again, just for speed. And then just the protection tool for the inside there. And then just some coloured wax on the inside. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're fairly simple and straightforward, so... Um, I'd, it's not as if I'd seen anything to do then, so mm. uh, I, I probably wouldn't say anyone's actually inspired me to do them. Obviously, see, I've seen a lot of people doing, I don't know, off-center or big wall plaques. So I thought I'd just do a small one. Then it turned out to be two and then three. So. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, you're lacquer in what process and how many coats of lacquer do you apply or what type of lacquer i used to do an awful lot of coats of lacquer um now i tend to only probably do about maybe four four coats maybe five coats maximum um as i said i started off on that blue one it was a couple of coats of satin it just, for some reason, seems a bit more bodied. And then I'll do a couple of coats of gloss lacquer. That was done with chestnut lacquers. Um, I also, if I can, I've got a tin down here, which I use as well, auto lacquers. Uh, nope, I moved them. Excuse me, they're up here. I saw these at the local petrol station once. So there, is that round the right way? Because on my iPad, it's back yeah, to front. Yeah, fine. Yeah, that costs £2.50, I think, compared to £8 for name brands. But predominantly, I tend to use chestnut. Um, this stuff is a lot thicker, so the drying time's an awful lot slower. But it does give you a really deep shine. But there's loads of other lacquers out there. Um, I just like chestnut ones for some reason. I've used them pretty much as long as I've been turning and better the devil you know sort of thing. Um, for your colouring, do you use mainly acrylics or spirit stains? It depends what colour I'm doing. Um, so obviously the little blue one that you can see there, that's Spirit Stains. Um, all the other ones there, they are acrylics. They're also dyes. Um, so paints, it's sort of 50 50 between acrylics and stains. I will admit, I do tend to use the Spirit Stain more than the water based stain, but I do use the water based stain as well just different colour variations that you can get from. Okay. Yep. I also use airbrush acrylics as well. Um, so if you want to try airbrush paints, Halfords do a little starter pack. Yeah, I tried them. They're <coughs> pretty much every colours plus white and black. But they're not too bad. Or you can go and buy expensive ones off the internet. Right. Um, when you're turning those planks, do you use a counterbalance of any sort? What I've done them with, um, I'll pretty much show you. There's several ways you can do it. If 
if you just bear with me, jump in and out of frame for a minute. I have used um, various different methods. So for these particular ones that I've done here, if I turn them round, there's no marks on them whatsoever. So all I did, and in fact, it was with this one that I actually done it with, so that's good. So I've got a piece of MDF there on the back. I've got a small face plate ring which clamps into your jaws. You just move that about and put it on the because they're quite small and they're quite thin. As long as you go fairly slow, they're not going to throw you about everywhere. And um, so all I've done with those is I had them stuck on the MDF board, and I hope you can probably still see the marks. So you've got one mark, two marks, three marks, the same down that side, and one at either top and bottom. That was done by hot melt glue. So you've got to make sure that the bottom is flat of your piece, and whatever you're gluing it to is nice and flat. Make sure your hot melt glue is extremely hot, and then just a couple of dabs there. If you want to be extra safe, do it all the way around if you want. Just means it's going to be more to to warm up and take off. Um, I have also done it a slightly different way as well. So again, similar sort of design. This is an old drawer base or something out of an old cupboard. Double-sided sticky tape. Good double-sided sticky tape though, not cheap stuff. <coughs> Put it on there and make sure they're both flat and it will hold as long as it's not too heavy, not too far off. On the back, I've got a wormhole screw and I had the largest jaws that I had that I could fit on here just so that it spread the weight of the timber as you're going up and down. Um, I've never really used counterweights because most of the pieces I've done off centre, although I've done, I think the maximum I've done is five and a half foot, it was quite well balanced and it wasn't too far off centre, if you know what I mean. And as long as that lace turning nice and slow, it's, it won't throw me, or it hasn't thrown me off yet. Um, so yeah, that's how I've done those three, just with hot melt glue, and just moved the faceplate ring up and down on the, the base. Okay. Yeah, um, one more question on the acrylics. Are they opaque? Some are, some aren't. <laughs> it depends what you're using. Um, I use so many different paints and colours. Some call them opaque, some call them um, iridescent, some call them translucent. Um, it just depends what make it is and what I'm using at the time. As I say, I use so many different makes. I also use um, little inks from that Dalla Rooney, I think they're from. So, so there, some of these are pearlescent, some of them are metallic. I've not got my glasses on to see what this one is. This is just like an artist's ink. It all depends pretty much on the maker and what I'm using it for. But I'd say probably most, most of the acrylics, I wouldn't class them as being opaque, really, because opaque, you tend to see through opaque, don't you? So... Okay, one more question. What's the right angle extension on the small lathe tailstock end used for? Oh, on the, the MIDI Pro. Right. You want about this one? 
whoever asked it. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, you can put a bed extension on there, and you can also put a bed extension on the end. So this headstock slides up and down, it rotates round and round. So pretty much if you have an extension out this way, you can move the head, rotate the head, just to get a better angle. Um, I think if you go on, I think Simon's website might show the extension. If not, the makers do. And that's Dreschel Bedarf Schultz. It's a German company. The ones that make the Stratos, as I said earlier. I've not got the extension, so. And they don't do a stand for that MIDI Pro either. Or not that I know of. So I made one myself. <clears throat> do you have a favourite make of airbrush? Not really. Cheap and cheerful. Yeah. <laughs> I've got I've got a good one, but I've got a set of cheap ones as well. I'm not a professional airbrush artist, so I don't need a really good one. Um tend to find the airbrushes or the airbrushing that I do, there's no real fine detail. So I'm not like drawing a really nice fine picture. So I don't need a professional airbrush. I think it's pretty much like most of the guys on here I've got. Uh, I think they're the same as Andrew's got, but I can't remember what that is. Um, yeah, so the answer to that is no, I've not got a, a preferred airbrush. Okay. I can't see the point, certainly at the stage that I use them, to go out and buy an expensive one. If one, I'm not going to like it. Not Two, I'm not going to be good with it. And three, I'm not doing any real detail work, so cheap and cheerful works for me. Obviously, it's not the cheapest one, but it's um, not too bad. Okay. Um... Are your legs bolted down or do you just rely on the ballast to keep them down? Just on the ballast on that. I used to have it bolted down. Um, I don't think I need it bolted down really. I don't tend to find them doing extremely large and off balance work that warrants me to bolt them down. Some people do, some people don't. You, I mean, there's lots of stories out there about bolting them down. Oh, no, that'll ruin the bearings. But unless you're using it day in, day out, 24 hours, or using some serious stuff, personally, I don't think it needs to be bolted down. There are holes in it for bolting it down, but I never have done. Well, apart from when it was first put in. And it's not going to be bolted down in the new place either. Okay, but not initially anyway. Another one for you. A request. Can you show a bit more about how your DIY Dremel fluting jig works? Yep. Yeah. Just give me a second. I'll just move the camera. So sorry for making you feel queasy. Ooh. Right, so I'll put that there. Let's change the view. Okay, so as I said, I've got a leather strop on here at the moment, so just pretend that's a bowl. So again, homemade bit of MDF and a wooden dowel. Get it to the position that you want it. Obviously, you can make it out of metal if you want. Put whatever tip you want on the end of your, your drill. And all it will do is slide on the shape. So you can do straight, you can do curved, you can follow the shape. You can, If you want, you can put guides on the board. 
so that it butts up against it just to follow it or you can do it completely freehand it's entirely up to you so as you can see that's extremely cheap off cuts of MDF that I've used and an extremely cheap <laughs> piece um, the only thing I did and I probably can't find them at the moment when you put the burrs in I made a little wooden piece to go over it just as a depth gauge so that I could try and keep the cut constant as it was going in um, a bit like the ones on that you can get from Paul Howard which is in that bag down there but that was actually made by a, a friend so does that answer the question or does he want any more information? I think it does, but there's another one. Does your jig align the, the tip of the tool with the centre height on the lathe? It will do when I move the rest up and down. Yeah. That's all you do, just up and down. And that will vary the, obviously it will vary the pattern as you're putting it in. And that's done obviously with the lathe stationary, not with it rotating. Because uh, I don't think that particular one's stubbed enough to do with it rotating. Not that I'd want to anyway. If I want to texture while it's rotating, I'll either use a texturing tool or a, an Arbitec or something like that, or a Proxon. <laughs> 